Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. We're glad to see you here. If you're a visitor with us, we give you a warm welcome and pray that this time is indeed helpful to you as you begin the new week. If you're visiting with us at home, online, through Facebook, we are again grateful for your presence and hope that our time together, you may feel included in our time together. There are several announcements in your bulletin and remind you that uh, our Vacation Bible School is, begins tomorrow night, Monday, and will be with us for three nights. And uh, looking forward to a good program and a hopeful uh, number of kids with us. Also, remind you in, in the bulletin, there's the announcement about the uh, Cortland Interfaith Council's golf tournament. And uh, if you're a golfer, uh, we hope you'll sign up, put together a team, uh, if you know someone who is, let them know. It'll be a good day. Are there other announcements to share this morning? Peace of Christ be with you. of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep God's covenants. Let us pray. Give your church, O God, the grace to serve you with courage, that our lives may be a witness to your compassion and our actions a testimony to your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
same God who recognizes our shortcomings also offers us mercy and hope and grace. Trusting in that gift of God, let us join together in our prayer of confession. God of mercy, we confess that we have failed to live as your beloved sons and daughters. We have set our minds on things of this world and we have neglected the inheritance of love you bestow upon your saints. We have pursued selfish aims in our daily business. We have harbored uncharitable thoughts towards our enemies and friends. We have different responsibilities to our neighbors. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from our selfish ways and strengthen us be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join me in silent prayer. Hear the good news. God is merciful. God is loving. God is generous with his mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all are forgiven. Amen. It's time for our sharing with children, so we'll invite Aaron Hart to come up and share with our kids. And Aaron, you're late. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. How's it going today? Good. Ooh, that microphone's working really well today. <laughs> I'll hold it down here. All right. And books. All right. Well, who do you like to watch when you're watching television these days? Things kind of changed for kids. It used to be like Sesame Street, then there was Blue's Clues. Who is it today? Who's, who's the, the major person or cartoon character or whatever you're watching on TV these days? Just give me one. Not the Wildcats? Oh, I've never seen that, I have to say. What else? Oh, Mickey, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is still around. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, you got to go to YouTube. You know, you can watch Gilligan's Island on YouTube nowadays. <laughs> Talk about a classic. Well, when I was your age, you know what one of my favorite shows was? Mr. No, Mr. Rogers. 
Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. Rogers. You can watch him on YouTube too. So why you have to go and watch Mr. Rogers on, on YouTube, okay? So Mr. Rogers would start out almost every show asking if we would be his neighbor. It's kind of weird the way we relate to TV people, but I kind of felt like I knew Mr. Rogers after a while and that he was actually my neighbor. And on television? On television. I know, you should have seen the TV we had back then. You had to get up and turn it. It weighed about 700 pounds. It was different. <laughs> so, I can remember a few things about Mr. Rogers and the things that he taught me, but I, I wanted to share one thing today that he really taught me that I tried to listen to, and I still try to listen to today. He said probably the most important thing we can do to be a good neighbor is to listen, to listen to people. Makes sense, right? So I think I heard, I'm not sure which one it was, but they were angry, it sounded like a few minutes ago. And you know what? She just wanted to be heard. She just wanted somebody to listen, because now she's in a good mood with her book. But have you ever felt sad? Have you ever, just look out, see, she's super happy. Have you ever felt sad or angry? And you just wanted somebody to hear you. I have. You just wanted somebody to listen and say, you know what, we know what you're going through. We, you know, maybe even, you know what, that makes me angry or sad too. And I'm here to be your neighbor. So this is probably more for the adults in the room than it is for you guys. But I'm planting a seed in your mind, Wyatt. <laughs> Today, do you know what the number one thing that we I can do? I my seed open. Uh-oh. <laughs> do, do you know what the number one thing that we can do to show somebody we're listening is? It used to be things like making eye contact, right? Or, you know, having a good posture when someone's talking to you. But today, the number one thing we can do is put our phone away. <laughs> you believe that? But they've actually done studies that show if you just put this thing in your pocket, just like that, and hide it so it can't be seen, it automatically shows people that you care about what they're saying. So something to think about as you get to be older. But here's the thing. You know who was probably one of the greatest listeners of all time? Jesus. He listened to all the people that he came into contact with. He listened to why they were hurting, why they were afraid. He even listened to why they were happy and he celebrated with them. So it's our job to do that for our neighbors. And our neighbors aren't just the people in this church or the people who live next to us. They're everybody in our community, in our country. And I think it'd be really good if we all started listening. We might not be as good as Jesus at listening, but we can get close. All right? Let's have a prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for these children. Open their hearts. Help them hear the people in their world that need them, need their love, need their understanding, need their beautiful energy. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. This is our, our time to share joys and concerns. We would, uh, Aaron's comments about Mr. Rogers reminded me that I had the privilege of meeting Fred Rogers when he spoke in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And many of you perhaps know he was a Presbyterian minister as well. And he began his ministry um, even before he was ordained working with children and was perhaps the first minister in the Presbyterian Church in recent history who was ordained to a ministry for children as opposed to a ministry for a congregation. Fred was a special man and we miss him. Other joys or concerns this morning that we want to share? That's a quiet group. 
quiet group. Yes, Carol. So, Carol, for those of you at home, Carol uh, thanks those who participated in the Man of La Mancha uh, production on Friday night, and it was, was fun, and it was well done. Other joys or concerns? Let's pray together. We thank you, O Lord, for this time together, for worship, for music, for prayer, for conversation and fellowship, for just being together in your presence. We draw on your word. We draw upon the teachings of Jesus Christ to live our daily lives and to relate to each other and meet the challenges of today and enjoy the work that you have set out for us to do. We pray for our church. We pray for our community. We pray for our nation and world. There are so many challenges that face us, so many obstacles to overcome. There is also so much pain, heartache, frustration. So speak to us and help us to be the ambassadors of your good news that brings healing, that brings comfort, and that equips us to serve. We pray for those who are sick, those who need your comfort and healing, those who face surgery, those who are recovering from surgery or accident, let healing be quick and pain at a minimum. We pray for those who face difficult choices, decisions about life and where to live or what to do or how to fully express their, their personhood. We pray for those who are victims of violence, violence in the home or violence outside the home or the violence of war and poverty. And we remember the people of Ukraine. Gracious God, there are also other challenges that face so many of us. Relationships, addiction, confusion, anger. Let your healing spirit move among us. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our first lesson comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. 
O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees.
And I say, wow. <laughs> Thank you, men. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Join me in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Most of the people who Jesus encountered in his ministry had some familiar, uh, yes, had some familiarity with the Hebrew scriptures. They had heard the scriptures read in the temple in Jerusalem or taught in the synagogues of their local communities. And if they had been raised in a religious home, they had memorized some verses as children, maybe the Ten Commandments or some of the Psalms. The familiarity with the book of Psalms was most common, for these were the songs, this was the music of the Jewish faith. Songs, you know, stick with us. Since Man of La Macha Friday night, those songs have been going through my head every waking and dreaming moment since then. Memory retains those words, those lyrics. And I suspect that of all the Psalms, Psalm 25 was one that people perhaps committed to memory. In it, the psalmist offers himself or herself to God. The psalmist declares their trust in God. And the psalmist asks that God be revealed and that God's mercy be abundant. Do not remember the sins of my youth, the psalmist wrote, or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. In my view, Psalm 25 is a prayerful song that would be meaningful in almost any circumstance of life. In times when things were good and in bad times as well. When one feels loved or when one feels abandoned. The lawyer who approaches Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan was a highly educated person for his day. 
He was bright. He could lead and read and write. He had studied the law of Moses and sat with others, had sat wrestling with how to apply it to daily life. He probably was faithful in, in his study in the synagogue and often went to worship where he could experience God's presence. I'm going to stop this one. Oh, it'll be on. There we are. Good. So that lawyer that approached Jesus, as Luke records it, was a man who undoubtedly knew Psalm 25. And maybe the words especially appealed to him, lead me in your truth and teach me. He had taken that to heart. He was a curious and lifelong learner. I probably would have liked him, respected his life of study, and admired his willingness to continue to learn and to listen to the opinions of others. In Luke's account that Nancy read for us this morning, Jesus is in the middle of his ministry. He taught, he healed, he shared his message about the kingdom of God, and many would learn and listen hopefully well, as Aaron told us, and would go home to reflect. Others who were bolder may have asked Jesus questions, or there were others who disputed what he had to say and were suspicious and hostile, and they would try to trap him into saying something that could be used against him. But this lawyer was different. He was among those who really sought an answer from Jesus. And Luke says that he stood up to test Jesus. Now, that, that may sound aggressive to us, but it was a common practice between teachers and students of the law. You would be tested in what you said or how you interpreted a passage. In fact, the, the lawyer honors Jesus by calling him teacher. That was not a casual form of address. It was conveyed as an appreciation of what Jesus was doing and, and, and saying. It conveyed honor and respect. And the lawyer asks a question that is both general and very personal to him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Not what must a person do or not must what, what, what uh, someone who is faithful do, rather, what must I do? So it was a very personal question. Jesus, returning the respect, says, what's written in the law? How do you read? He wants to hear what Jesus has to say. He wants to hear what the lawyer has to say. And Jesus invites him into conversation into dialogue. The lawyer quotes the Hebrew scriptures, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you've, you've answered rightly, correctly. That's what the scripture tells us. That's what God wants. But the lawyer has an additional question. He has a follow-up question. But who is my neighbor? It's a curious question. The lawyer should have known the answer because that was found in the law. It was found in their daily practice. Neighbors were those in your community. Neighbors were those you felt a bond with and felt comfortable with. Neighbors were people who shared your beliefs and your values. Neighbors shared your tradition and your culture. 
Now, there were others outside your social, cultural, and religious boundaries. We call them aliens or foreigners, Gentiles, or the other. One would never call them neighbors, even if they lived right next door. You might treat them with courtesy and kindness, but you would never see them as your neighbor. Jesus then, in the custom of those who sought to teach and learn, offers a story, a parable, that famous parable of the Good Samaritan. It's perhaps Jesus' most well-known parable. It tells a story that we can easily relate to because it It speaks of violence and need and fear and selfishness and care and trust and compassion, the gamut of human emotions. I can imagine that the lawyer listening carefully to Jesus quickly identified with those characters in the story. That's what a a parable does. He could identify with the man who lay in that ditch beaten and left half dead. He knew that that man in the ditch was a a fellow Jew, a countryman. He knew that the road to Damascus from Jerusalem to Jericho was dangerous. There were robbers and dangerous animals. It was never traveled at night without protection. The lawyer could imagine what it must have felt like to be set upon, to be beaten and robbed and left semi-conscious in the dirt. (coughs) He could imagine what it was like to see through bloody eyes the images of travelers walking by. Unable to cry out or even move, one could only hope that someone would stop to help. And there was that priest and that Levite. But they kept going. Our lawyer probably could identify with the priest. He was probably headed to the temple in Jerusalem. He had duties to perform. He'd gone through all the proper rites of purification so that his heart and soul would be pure to serve God in this very sacred place. If he stopped to help the man, he would be defiled. He would have to go through purification all over again. And the man was already probably dead. And he would be late as well. So the priest kept going. Our lawyer could identify with the Levite. Also educated in the law of Moses This Levite maybe had special duties to attend to in Jericho. Maybe he had been sent by the high priest on an urgent mission. Maybe he had documents to deliver. And he knew that those who had assaulted the man in the ditch might be hiding behind some brush or behind some rocks, just waiting for someone else to to stop and help. Then they would have a new victim. And so the Levite hurried on. Our lawyer did have difficulty, however, identifying with the Samaritan. Samaritans were unacceptable to a good Jew. They were cousins, yes. They observed the law of Moses, but they had remained behind during the Babylonian captivity, and they worshiped not in the temple in Jerusalem, but on a mountain far away. They were outside of the boundaries, if you will, of Israel and Judah. They were unclean, and the stereotype was that they were inferior, ignorant, unfaithful, and mostly untrustworthy. And yet, it was the Samaritan who stopped to help. He cleansed and dressed the man's wounds. He gave him something to drink. He put him on his own beast and took him to an inn along the road, took care of him, and then paid the innkeeper for his room and care, promising to return if more care and more time was needed. Looking deeply into the lawyer's eyes, 
Jesus then asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to a man, to the man who fell into the hands of a robber? The lawyer answered probably with a whisper and a light of recognition in his eyes, the one who showed him mercy. Go and do likewise, Jesus said. The message of that parable that touched the heart of the lawyer that day and touches us still has several points. Children of God are also included. The Samaritans are also included as children of God. The human boundaries of race and nationality and culture are not important to Jesus, and they're not important to God. But then the message also is, words are good, but actions are even better. The priest and Levite may have felt concern. They may have hoped that someone would come along to help the man. They may have even often offered a prayer or a word of encouragement under their breath, but they didn't act. They kept walking. It was the Samaritan without words who stopped and helped. He did something. He helped and provided both immediate and long-term care. We face many challenges today in our nation, in our communities, in our world. Words are good. Prayers are important. But commitment and action will make the difference. Jesus says, go and do. And may God point us the way and show us what to do. Amen. Join me, if you will, in the affirmation of faith that's printed in our bulletin. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. For we know that all things for those who love God, who are called according to God's purposes. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
now go in peace, and may the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be in the bide with you this day, this night, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.